From Haiti to Lebanon, from Timor-Leste to Liberia, from Kosovo to Darfur, and in more than a dozen other missions around the world, UN peacekeepers are in the front pages and on the front lines, working to bring peace to some of the world's most vulnerable people. Never before has UN peacekeeping been as big as it is today. And never before has the United Nations been asked to make such a broad contribution to peace, security, and development in societies that have suffered through conflict. The United Nations has become the essential organization for responding to international crises. But it wasn't always so. What we now call peacekeeping came about as an improvisation, a response to the practical need to contain conflict, to allow a breathing space for negotiation and reconciliation. In the aftermath of World War II, the United Nations emerged as a beacon of hope for a war-weary public. May I invite the leaders of delegation. As the delegates of 50 nations met in San Francisco to sign the UN Charter, no one had predicted the need for UN peacekeepers. Long live the United Nations. But it wasn't long before the Cold War descended on the world making it difficult for the UN Security Council to agree on matters of peace and security. New ways to ease tensions and address conflict had to evolve. In 1948, with the end of the British mandate in Palestine and the birth of Israel, the UN was suddenly drawn into a full-scale international crisis. The loss of life in the Holy Land must be brought to an immediate end. Following the first Arab-Israeli war, the Security Council brokered a truce between the two sides. An American, working for the United Nations, Ralph Bunch, was asked to organize UN military observers to monitor and supervise this truce. They would be the first UN peacekeepers. These successful armistice negotiations have demonstrated conclusively the ability of the United Nations to mediate a serious conflict and to avert a dangerous threat to the peace. These military observers became known as UNSO, the UN Truce Supervision Organization in the Middle East, which still operates to this day. A similar observer group was sent to Kashmir to monitor the ceasefire between Pakistan and India in 1948. But eight years later, in 1956, a new crisis erupted in the Middle East over the Suez Canal. As the military forces from three countries, France, Britain, and Israel, became embroiled in Egypt, new action was taken at the United Nations. The cessation of hostilities... Here, a dramatic proposal by Canada's Minister of External Affairs, Lester Pearson, marked a new phase for UN peacekeeping. The proposal made in the General Assembly by the Foreign Minister of Canada was a major landmark in the history of the United Nations and in the development of what we now call peacekeeping. Up to that time, unarmed military observers had done a noble job of monitoring and supervising the truces and ceasefires in the Middle East and in Kashmir. But in 1956 at Suez, we were dealing with a major war. The Suez Crisis called for the creation of a peacekeeping force, armed units that could form a buffer zone between the warring parties. This was a radically new element. Also new were the now famous blue helmets worn by the peacekeepers. As members of the United Nations Emergency Force, you are taking part in an experience that is new in history. You are soldiers of peace in the first international force of its kind. Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld provided the basic principles on which the force operated, rules that remain the basis for many future operations. The first principle is that the parties in conflict be ready to accept the presence of UN peacekeepers to help them resolve their differences. Secondly, a ceasefire must be in place. And thirdly, peacekeepers will not use force except in self-defense. With these principles as a guide, the United Nations carried out several peacekeeping missions including large operations in the Congo, in Lebanon, and in Cyprus. 
The end of the Cold War marks another watershed, ushering in an era of unprecedented expansion in UN peacekeeping. Everybody thought that the UN had been prevented from playing its full role as the organization that keeps peace and security in the world by the Cold War. So I think we all thought that once the Cold War was over, then the UN would have, you know, no problem whatsoever fixing any problem anywhere in the world. And I think we did at the beginning. In Namibia and in Cambodia, but also in Mozambique and in El Salvador, UN interventions brought positive outcomes. But then we hit some very, very uh, uh, serious problems. The breakup of the former Yugoslavia, the genocide in Rwanda, the difficulties in Somalia and elsewhere brought some very clear lessons home for peacekeeping. Until the 1990s, peacekeeping had mostly been about containing conflict between countries. But then some countries began to break apart. In some places, national institutions collapsed almost entirely. The Blue Helmets got bogged down in places where there was no peace to keep. UN peacekeepers were frequently not given the mandate or resources necessary to prevent violence or protect civilians on the ground. But just as the usefulness of UN peacekeeping was beginning to be questioned by some, there was another turning point. By the end of the 1990s, UN peacekeeping was called upon to rebuild and help govern territories on opposite sides of the globe. Kosovo came up. Who could have done Kosovo except the United Nations? And then Timor. And again, who could have done Timor except the United Nations? Ten years later, UN peacekeeping is even more in demand and is building on many of the lessons of the past. We cannot go everywhere, that we have got to limit a little bit what we take on, and also that we have got to try not to raise expectations too high. More and more you see peacekeeping missions in countries that have had a civil war and where the presence of the peacekeepers is an important contribution to bringing the country back to a real peace. Today's efforts link peacekeeping to other areas of UN action, like humanitarian aid, the monitoring of human rights, and disarmament. But that's not all. UN peacekeepers are, in many cases, participating in building national institutions, training the police, assisting the justice systems, and supporting democratic elections. We deploy complex, integrated missions that bring together a political framework and economic uh, reconstruction, rehabilitation where possible. In this world of multidimensional peacekeeping, hey! women peacekeepers are playing a key role, adding strength to UN operations while empowering women in the societies where they are deployed. In all these conflict uh, situations, we see that more often than not, women have been uh, uh, more victimized than uh, the men. And also we see that in many situations, women can play a major role in rebuilding the peace. To be effective, today's Blue Helmets have to be organized. A world-class support system must be in place to back them. Peacekeeping is routinely uh, between the 20th and 25th largest aviation fleet in the world. In many cases, uh, these peacekeeping missions come to places where there is absolutely nothing. No infrastructure, no housing, no accommodation, no office space, no, no water or ablution facilities, and all of this has to be built from the ground up. One lesson learned through past experience, every mission is different such as the mission in Haiti. A MINUSTA pode ser considerada e é uma real MINUSTA is a real coming together of countries in an effort to aid Haiti. Da América do Sul e mais um país da América Central. We have the commitment and troops from eight South American countries and one from Central America, all working together 
under the United Nations to help Haiti solve its problems. In some cases, UN peacekeeping now works with regional organizations in partnership. Like the one with the African Union, or AU, over the difficult task of keeping the peace in Darfur. This is the first hybrid mission in the world. The UN has got experience in peacekeeping, not only now, but for over, over half a century now. The AU has the understanding, has the sympathy of dealing with people from the same cultural background. When you bring these two organizations together, they come in with their strong point. Each one of them has its own strong point. Mr. President, the mandate to protect civilians does not end at sunset. UN peacekeepers now have more robust mandates to help protect civilians more effectively by using tactics such as day and night patrols. UN peacekeepers are also playing a key role in stabilizing societies by strengthening the rule of law. The police, UN police, uh, engage in patrolling, but they also engage in monitoring, mentoring, training, capacity building, so that this task can be taken over increasingly by uh, the local populations and the local societies. Around the world, the UN is working for peace at a total cost of less than half of 1% of the world's military spending. We have proved in the beginning of the uh, 21st century, nobody can do it better, nobody can do it cheaper, uh, no, nobody can do it with more chance for success. The challenges are great as are the sacrifices. But the rewards are also great. Much has changed since the early days, but what's required of UN peacekeepers is still the same. Courage, humility, persistence, and the belief that by working together, we can make a better world. After 60 years, United Nations peacekeeping is still evolving and it is still making a difference in the lives of millions of people around the world. In my own experience, in my eight years or so at the helm of United Nations peacekeeping, I've learned that our most important asset is our people. People who had the price of precious time away from family and friends, and sometimes at considerable personal risk, dedicate themselves to the principles of these organizations. Women and men, from very different countries, from rich countries, from poor countries, who come together with a sense of common purpose for the common good. People who never cease to persevere in order to be the voice of those who do not have a voice. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.